I will call the regular meeting of the Nevada City Council to order on Monday, August 23rd, 2021 at 6.02 p.m. Can we get a roll call, please? Here. Jason Sampson? Here. Jane Nielsen? Here. Jane Here. Here. First item is approval of the agenda. Here. I missed you. <laughs> Sorry. It's been one of those six. Okay. Move to approve. Sorry. Brian, Jason, any discussion? Please go. Okay. Agenda is approved. Takes us the Takes us to the consent agenda. Any item may be removed for separate consideration. Second. Okay, Jason and Thanks. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, council please vote. That is approved. Takes us to the public forum, which is time set aside for comments from the public on topics of city business other than those listed on the agenda. No action may be taken. Uh, we have a couple items in the public forum. First is Kathy Vincent We're talking about 4th of July fireworks. Mm -hmm. Hello. I'm here to give you money. So, yay for Kathy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, I, if some of you may remember, as a private citizen last year, I went around and um, with some of my volunteers and we gathered donations for the fireworks. We wanted to make sure that they continued. So, this year we did something a little more structured. And I'm a member of the American Legion Auxiliary. And as their uh, community outreach chair, we have decided that as an organization, we will take that on. We've committed to raising funds for four years. The target I was giving by the city was $2,500 for the next four years. So that was our goal this year. And I'm here to present to you a check for $2,750. We exceeded our goal. Um, this check is issued by the Legion, but um, I'll read really fast, but I would like to read off the names of the businesses that contributed instead of doing the can project, um, I just asked a handful of businesses to write me a good size check. And so here's who said yes. Um, American Legion, of course, we were the first ones that donated. Vincent Trucking, Mark Wilson Real Estate, Nevada Hardware, Nevada Monument, Allen Cocoa Company, Farmhouse Catering, Hetzler and Rhodes, Meyer, Meyer Chiropractic, KPPM, Kelly Laundry, Casey's Heating and Cooling, Good and Quick, on track construction, Jeremy Earl's Mac Tools, New Care Pharmacy, and Sweet Dreams Mattress Center. So those were the folks that contributed to your 2750. Thank you. Thank you. I think she is. Well, and maybe Ray too. Well, I'm here. 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 Okay, next item is a new police officer. So I know our director is probably super excited about this part. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, I had this, uh, I had Nick prepare this for me. Um, Nicholas moved to Nevada on before his freshman year in Nevada High School, meeting his future wife. 
Christina went there. During high school, Nicholas competed in varsity cross country, track, and wrestling. After graduating in 2016, Nicholas enlisted in the Army as Airborne Infantry stationed in Anchorage, Alaska. From 2017 to 2018, he was deployed to Afghanistan, being attached to Special Operations Team. Upon arrival, uh, back to, from overseas, Nicholas proceeded to marry his fiance and high school sweetheart and had one child with another now on the way. Nicholas was later assigned as a team leader in which he supervised and oversaw the training and practice of his soldiers. Nicholas was honorably discharged in December of last year after four, four plus years in the service and wanting to continue his service on a local level, joined the Nevada Fire Department and has looked to law enforcement as his future. Uh, I will say that, uh, thank you for doing this, Nick. Um, he's worked pretty hard to get to this place and um, uh, has overcome everything that needed to be done during the testing process and all that. So um, one of the conversations we had back in July, <clears throat> I had told him that the way the process falls, he may not be able to <clears throat> provide a lot of notice to his employer and he may have to start like, like as soon as I give him the job offer, which, I offered him the job on Friday and he took it and now he's here. So um, he'll be here for about a week. He's got to do some firearms, some other training. we got to get him suited with a uniform and he'll start at the academy a week from today. So it's going to be pretty rusty for him. So um, Nick, you want to introduce your dad, your guests? Uh, I'm Nick Okay, it's all yours, Mayor. Sounds good. Well, Nick, we'll meet you right up here. Is there anyone else here to speak in the public forum? Seeing none, we'll close the public forum. And Marlis, when, before you go, Zoom says we're live on Facebook. Facebook doesn't have a feed, so you'll have to probably post the video later. Um, old business, approved pay request number 14 for the Central Business District Infrastructure Project from Construct, Inc. in the amount of $387,225.70. I would like, uh, I would like to actually the amount a little bit and have that uh, minus eleven thousand seven hundred and seventy seven dollars and sixty cents cents which would be the painted pavement markings have that uh, taken out of the total amount which would bring it down to three three hundred seventy three hundred and seventy five thousand four hundred and forty eight dollars and ten cents people confer a motion with the amended dollars amended I'll second that. And Sandy, any discussion? Seeing none, council, please vote. Okay, that's approved. Takes us to old business B, everybody's favorite topic, discussion appropriate follow-up on COVID-19 policies. Anything anyone would like to discuss for changes? We discussed last time the vaccination rate of employees, very low in my opinion. Um, so what would be the, I think it'd be good to 
Well, new employees are our greatest asset, so we need to protect them as best as we can. So asking them to wear masks and all the conditions that we've talked about in the past to wear masks when you're unable to social distance, you're inside, all those types of things I think would be a good idea. We have to ensure continuity of service as well. So if an outbreak happens in a department, you try to avoid that, I think. That's the one thing I think I'd like to see us move forward on. What recommending it, you mean, or making it mandatory? Asking me? Not vaccinated. I'm asking whoever wants to answer the question. Well, and there's a lot of things for vaccinated or unvaccinated. I'm saying for all of them. I'd like to see it be mandatory. I think, I think we need to. I think we're opening a can of worms we can't close because if our governor isn't going to make it, we can't really do it. We're just asking for trouble. I mean, unless she wants to say we can have a mask mandate, I don't think we can make it mandatory without having pushback. Also, we've got to have just one employee pushback and we have to do it. We can't do it. Mary can probably speak to that point. It's more in her wheelhouse. Yeah. I mean, the, the risk that's out there is that the May proclamation said that you could not mandate masks on city owned property. And I know that the intent was not that it facilitate the employees of cities, um, but I think there's question out there. I think that leaves it left a very gray area for the mandate of, of city and county employees. Now that said, I also know that um, there are a lot of cities that are mandating masks for their employees, um, some that we represent. So, um, it, but we've told them that we can't be certain that there is, if there's a challenge that the city would be successful. So um, that, is, that is the risk. And I think that there's certainly a, a health concern out there um, that that's your decision to say whether that risk is greater than the risk of a legal challenge. That's my only fear. I mean, I'm all for strongly recommending it is strong language we can use. I don't know if mandating is the thing to do or not. I don't know. Just put it out there. And then some employers are doing it for unvaccinated folks as a way to encourage them to get vaccinated. Well, might we? I would have a. I would. I would caution against that because I do think that that. I think that alerts everybody to somebody's medical status. And I think there's even a greater risk of challenge with that. So if you are going to do it, I would recommend that you mandate it for all, as opposed to singling out those that have or have not been vaccinated. And might we partner that with some of the practices we were doing, some of the practices we were doing early on in COVID where city employees are not like in the same pickup together or the same, you know, so that they're spending you know, if streets department's got a couple people on a project that they would drive separate vehicles and not be enclosed more than 15, 20 minutes. I mean, if they're just driving, you know, three blocks, but can we partner some of those things we were doing early on to protect the continuity of services or particularly at water and wastewater? Yeah, I can, I can look at ways to mitigate exposure to one another and, and talk with their department heads and figure out ways we can help help with that so we can um, prevent any type of staff breakout with COVID or anything. Yeah, because early on, we were they were shifting, you know, like working different days and stuff. And I don't think I don't see any reason for that. But I think well, we have some new information now. Right. And yeah, but just to just to mitigate and and make sure that they can stay as well as possible. I will, yeah, I, I will include that in our staff agenda and talk about that at our next meeting. And coming up probably October, a lot of employees will be eligible for a third dose, depending on eight months from when. They started to get it, which I all brothers together, but it was probably March. <laughs> We're going to figure out what kind of metrics we can get our hands on to measure whether we're a hot spot or how things are going in the county or anything like that. 
Not necessarily. I mean, we already talked last week about the countywide vaccination data that's as granular as I've been able to find. And there's the weekly numbers from the state, but for the same reasons we talked about before, the um, the positivity rates you're using with four don't exactly translate. So that's the challenge. I, I think for me, a lot of what I keep my try to keep my eyes on is what is what our hospitalization and bed capacity look like, um, which hasn't in, in Iowa, knock on wood, been threatened like other states. Uh, I have no problem requiring employees to wear masks in the situations we talked about. I think we owe it to the people of the city to make sure that we can continue to provide the services we provide. Certainly not the only ones. No. Not the only one leading that charge. If we, so you're proposing in situations where they're together for within six feet for is it the 15 minute type thing barbara saying all the, yeah all the stuff we had before yeah so what do we do if somebody doesn't want to wear a mask fire them reprimand them send them home for the day with pay would it be oh. different i'm asking would it be different than if they didn't show up in their uniform or if they didn't show up at with Absolutely. Different. Different work boots would it be the same situation? It is because it's a choice. You choose to wear yours today. That's fine. I may choose not to. I, you know, wear mine sometimes when I go and there's a lot of people. Sometimes I don't. I'd say they, they both can be argued. I mean, it's a safety thing to your argument. You're, you know, you're trying to protect the safety of others. And same with boots. The reason we, we require uh, steel toed boots isn't. For the safety of it, so I, I think it can go both ways. I think to the point that was made, though, if you're going to make it a requirement, there has to be a consequence if you don't follow the requirement that the council is setting. So um, you do have to be prepared to take disciplinary action. And if so, would you guys? I mean, how would you would you like me to go through that the same way as other? actions or i mean i think part of the discussion should be what's the ultimate goal is it you know to protect operational the operational ability within departments because if that's the goal you really have to think through the quarantine dominoes that can fall if people start testing positive so that's where vaccinating slash and or masking prevents people from having to quarantine for exposure within the department and not have to go home because the danger would be if you have a bunch of folks in a, the whole department in one area and no masks and lack of vaccines, well, then you could potentially have the whole department have to go home for 10 days, which obviously would be a problem. So I think ultimately that's probably what I'm hearing is probably the ultimate concern. So you'd want to craft your policy around that if that's what your concern is. So Jordan, can you see a way to do that as in a way that would parallel other things? If somebody is um, somebody acts in a way that jeopardizes the continuity of services, I mean, if if there's something set up for that, a first you know a first offense, a conversation, whatever it is, can you can you see a way that this would fit that same so that we're not creating something new, but we're just asking for another piece of equipment and yeah yeah I, I yeah i do believe there is yeah you could always recommend for two weeks and see how it goes and then require if it's not followed or maybe have department heads talk with their crew and see how much pushback we'd really need. maybe i'm jumping the gun maybe everybody's on board Maybe no problem. Maybe everybody doesn't care about wearing a mask. Well, there's certainly probably are people that would prefer that people do. If they're, you know, if they're feeling compromised at all, and there's probably some that would think it's not a bad idea. Well, I think our department has probably no better how often their employees are going to be in close quarters for that period of time. It might be very minimal. Yeah. I like the 
baby steps. Like, let's try it. Revisit it in a couple of weeks. All right. Uh, so what I have in my notes is I will meet with the department heads, discuss this, and uh, check about recommending it for two weeks. And then we can come back at a council and I can discuss how things were going and then make a, make a recommendation then. Leave it on the agenda like we have. Yeah, leave it on the agenda. For me. Thanks. Anything else on that topic? We'll move on to new business with resolution number 9, 2021-2022. Resolution declaring intent to provide economic development support to development project at 1133 6th Street. And we have some folks from Main Street here to lay out the request. Very stylish Henry Corbin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mayor has good taste in uh, polos <laughs> too. So um, I want to thank you all for letting us present tonight. Um, and then also thank you for your past support of our projects through Main Street Nevada and uh, for your potential support of this project. And so um, this is for the Iowa Challenge Grant, um, which last in 2020 we applied for on the Union Block or the Gatherings Project um, and were awarded that grant. Uh, that project's now underway with a hopeful completion date around the uh, beginning of the year. Uh, but the grant this year is a $100,000 matching grant that's up from $75,000 last year. So they've increased that, um, showing support for that program. Um, but this year we are applying for uh, the journal building, which could have been included in the photos and diagrams that we sent out. Uh, and the journal building um, is really one of the more iconic buildings downtown, although it's one of our smallest ones, it has uh, probably one of the most uh, distinguishable uh, facades. And so um, the goal behind that project is to actually create new retail space in the form of a second facade on the rear half of that building, um, which we'll have Tom here in a bit talk a little more on that plan. But um, that second facade, but also pursuing historic tax credits for the project, which this will be our first endeavor in a project downtown um, in pursuing those historic tax credits. So um, along with that, uh, the goal is to really make this a teaching opportunity um, to show how those credits can be used and also how to do a qualified rehab on a historic building. Um, and so I'll go ahead and have Tom come up here and share a little bit on the vision of the building. Uh, he is the owner of the journal building, and um, I'll go ahead and let you come up and share the vision for the property. Thank you for letting me come here. I feel a little bit like I'm on the end of the diving board. Trying to think about and of it trying to evaluate ideas and about how to improve downtown with the, the town of Nevada and, and in particular now the downtown core. So we are uh, we're bringing this project to you. I've been um, interested in historic preservation for many years. Um, I bought the drill building in 1999. I, uh, that's when I went into business for myself as a carpenter. And I just needed a place to set up my shop. And that building was in fairly rough condition. It, um, the back wall, the, there had been an addition on the back of the building and it had collapsed. I don't know, Barb, you probably remember that. And Sandy, you might go, you guys go back that far. I'm not sure anyone else does. Maybe Jason, you do, and Brian. Um, I have some photos. Um, there was just a kind of a temporary wall Directed across the back of the building, and um, I had Mason come and put a, a new block wall up on top of the old brick footings where the, where the original back wall had been. And even then, I, I tried to shape the openings so that they were 
um, in the style of an old building. As I, was, I had been thinking someday, if all the stars would align correctly, uh, maybe I could do something with that building. Uh, it originally had a, um, a public area on the front that uh, is kind of defined. It has a high ceiling that has a fancy metal ceiling, and then there's an archway, and then the rest of the ceiling is, is just boards. And that was a production area, and they, they literally did everything. They brought paper and ink in there and did the whole newspaper there, and you could look back there and see it being done. And um, there were windows all along the south wall of the building. Now, uh, two of those have been blocked by a, a building that has been built adjacent to the south. There was a skylight in the center of the building that let light in for that production area. That's been uh, long ago demolished and roofed over. So I've always, well, after I got going in there with my woodworking shop, my carpentry shop, I had the bright idea that I could still run out the front. So that's how we got into this concept of having two businesses in there. I, I built a, Sean Cole made me build a two hour firewall in there to separate them. Um, and so over the years, I've this idea has emerged of put that skylight back and develop an atrium there in the center of the building and then have uh, really separate the building front to rear and have a, so there'd be a, uh, a place that opens up out onto 6th Street, but then there'd also a storefront that opens a facade that addresses the alley. As, as you drive west on Lincoln Way, approaching 6th, if you look over, you can see into that open area. And I just think there's potential uh, for, for the back sides of those buildings um, to, or something, something could happen back there. Um, so actually I planted a tree back there. I've got a hawthorn tree growing on a, on a little patch of lawn back in back of the building. And I just think there could be a green space and uh, entrance uh, and a little parking area and an entrance to the back of the building. And so that's just kind of been my thought. And um, I had advocate, I've advocated for Main Street to come to Nevada for many years. I remember talking to Jean Gildersleeve about it when she was the chamber uh, executive director years ago. Um, and uh, it just never happened. Uh, I was on the, I, I was the chairperson of the Historic Preservation Commission, Nevada Historic Preservation Commission. I kind of tried to promote it. And I just uh, thought it's just not going to happen in Nevada. And then all of a sudden it happened. But a bunch of people I didn't know started Nevada Main Street and hired Henry. And, it's really going good. And so the stars have aligned to uh, make it with this challenge grant and perhaps with your support to make this happen. It'd be a good thing for me personally uh, to have this inflow of capital. But I also think it, would, it could be a good thing for downtown just to have it, one of the buildings really well, uh, well done, uh, everything fixed on it, let's say. Um, but also the path that I want to take to that is to, to plan this thing from the beginning as a qualified rehab. That's kind of a term of art. Qualified means it qualifies for the tax credits. And to qualify for the tax credits, you have to jump through a series of hoops with the state historic preservation people. And um, I have I've seen projects 
that have done this, and and I like what I see. They they look sharp, but they also preserve the historic aspects of the of the property. Um, and I I've seen people start on a project and then try to bring the tax credit aspect in, and they're already too far down the road with their planning. So that's maybe another thing that's different about the approach I'm taking is, is that I'm, I'm already talking to uh, preservation architects and I have one engaged uh, to help me plan this project so that um, we can make use of the challenge grant and hopefully in, uh, we actually we need your support to, to show the state office that, that we have local support. But also these tax credits, if we can if we can make it happen, we can get a lot of bang out of for our bucks, and we can get a, a project that'll really be uh, have a have a lot of impact by its just strong visual improvement, and also by bringing another retail um, spot to downtown. So it just seems like there's a lot of potential, but I'm kind of prejudiced, so I'm throwing the ball to you. Well, I, I've, we've, I submitted the idea to the local review committee and they, they selected it. So they, they agree that it's, that it's a potentially good project. So now we come to you to ask you also to support it. So I'm yeah. Am I yeah. <laughs> might help council to know how many building owners were interested in, in the grant too for Tom to get selected from. Yes. Yeah, so um, this year we actually sent out um, through our, I guess, our email and our newsletter um, a at local level application process. Um, and we had eight individuals uh, express interest in that. And um, already some of them are already getting the paperwork kind of put together with some estimates and uh, that's been something that has been great that as we look at the local level and we look at those who are interested seeing that they're going out there and they're starting to you know converse with those that do the construction looking at what this is going to cost them a little bit and kind of creating a vision almost and thinking about it so uh the eight this year uh that was a huge leap uh last year we had just a, a small handful and so uh, it's exciting to see that there are others that see the potential for this and how it can make an impact here. So Tom's project um, scored really well. Um, also because at the state level, Main Street Iowa is really encouraging looking at the back of those buildings. And um, what's historically been looked at as kind of a storage room or a empty space. And the back of the facade really doesn't kind of get as much glory, I guess. And so when we brought this project up to them in their last visit, they were very excited about it because it's actually something they're gonna be encouraging in the coming years uh, for communities to look at. So we have a really good opportunity to kind of set a precedent here and, and show that we're, uh, we're kind of ahead of the trends. So um, I, if there's any questions for this project or um, any questions the council has, I'd be happy to answer them now. What's the intended reuse then of the building? The intended use uh, would be two potential retail spaces. Um, so front half of the building and back half. Um, of course, Tom would have to relocate his shop, but he's uh, happy to do that uh, if there are two good tenants that are looking for the space. So um, that's the end goal of the property. So you do have some leads on tenants? We, you know, we, we do have a lot of interest in coming here to the community. That's one of the things that's been great over the last year um, is there's a lot of interest in coming to the community. Just finding a spot for them is predominantly the main obstacle there. And so uh, these two spots, we really don't doubt that we can find uh, two good tenants for that building. So are you going to be totally flipping tenants then? Do you have professional services in there now? Yeah. Um, I I didn't like to go to the professional services for the back. They, they've been great tenants. That's what this communication sure. But then in the front, then it's it's wide open. Right. 
I mean, I can only speak for myself. I'd much rather see a, a retail business in the front that's going to draw walking traffic mm -hmm. a little more. Than that's one of the Main Street strategies, too, right. is to you have to have other places to help businesses locate to maybe someplace that's more appropriate so that the retail businesses of the foot traffic can then come downtown. So it's a domino. Right. Tom also alluded to the value of Main Street for Nevada. And one of the values is this very program, the challenge grant is only available to communities that are in the Main Street program. So that is definitely, you're doing a great job. Obviously people are catching on if we had eight applicants locally. What a great value, return on investment. We we're hoping that by one success story, you'd have more people coming forward. And mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's our real hope with this project, too, is it's going to be kind of a teaching learning environment in and of itself. And so uh, that's something that we're really excited about being able to do. I love the idea of a green space in the back, too. That mm -hmm. would be kind of nice. Mm -hmm. This mirrors exactly what we did for the other building. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. You know, with Evie's, they're creating that space upstairs. John <clears throat> creating the, the housing up, upstairs with the business downstairs, and they're doing the same thing <coughs> with, with Tom's. As far as the financials. So finan saying. financials, I believe it was 10000 for one, 15000 for another. Yep. So um, we based this off of the last two applications, um, where it was twenty percent, or sorry, ten percent of the combined matching funds, which would be two hundred in this thousand, so twenty thousand, um, along with the five-year TIF rebate agreement, and then waiving of inspection fees and permits. And that was actually something in our last applications we've been applauded for is a really strong share of support um, from the city um, through those. So. Um, we just based it off of those um, as they've been really successful and um, we've we've gotten a lot of good feedback from that. Move to approve resolution number nine. I'll second. And Dane, any other discussion? I will say as we invest more dollars in downtown, I hope we, and I think I said this last time we did one of these, I hope we continue to remember the investing in communities a multi-front battle and there's a lot of people that we serve especially through the human services fund that deserve to be uh, invested in as well so i hope we don't lose track of all of the multiple fronts we can help the community as well anything else Seeing none council please vote Okay, that is approved. Thank you all for everything you're doing and excited to see where it goes. Good luck, Tom. Thanks. Moves this to new business B, resolution number 10, 2021 2022, resolution for support of the Fieldhouse project and submission of an enhanced Iowa community attraction tourism application and authorize the mayor to sign. So, uh, Brenda's coming forward and I'll give you some background here. So good evening, Nevada Council. I almost feel a little guilty that I get a slip in here at the 11th hour uh, to pull together the final details of the com uh, community attraction and tourism application on your behalf uh, for the state of Iowa. So um, I've done uh, a number of these over the years and I have to applaud uh, first the city council in your support of the project, even before I think we consider another action tonight uh, for the strong support of the project and then really in fairly short order how the community has come together uh, to support the private fundraising aspects of this. So we're sitting here today um, not really talking about a whole lot of a gap. And so uh, with your blessing, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little sense of how the project's coming together. Uh, and then ultimately this is going to lead to a consideration tonight of, of some action on your part. But we're balancing all of the numbers to an estimate uh, that your contractors, uh, back in 19, you, you asked for uh, a proposal and awarded a proposal uh, to RMH to put together all of the construction details, the drawings, all the things that you've been working from uh, over the last um, almost two years. So um, we are balancing towards an estimate of 7 million 
$784,674. And uh, as a part of that estimate, there is a contingency in that estimate of seven, 707698 So as we've been moving through the numbers and, and getting to kind of what is, what is there for a gap as we're building a case for the state uh, to participate in the project, that 707 coming in at this point is left kind of what, what appears on paper to be a large gap. And uh, so to refresh everybody's memory, the city's already committed four and a half million to the project. Uh, Story County supervisors have approved $400,000 of support, which is key to allow you to even apply for a CAT grant. Um, this is the date uh, for private fundraising as of last week when we met. I have a feeling that there's more dollars that have come in uh, to Lisa, who's coordinating and keeping track of those contributions. But as of last week, we're at $1,350,650, which is impressive. Uh, so I, I can't highlight that enough. That number actually is higher. Um, then I know what we talked about. So when it goes in, we'll have the most accurate number there. Uh, the group has been um, successful in a Kenny Lundstrom grant for $5,000. Uh, we're working on the final details of an in-kind contribution for $30,000. Uh, we'll be requesting $750,000 from the state of Iowa, uh, which when we look at all those numbers, I'll, I'll do the math for you. We're at about $41,000 worth of a gap. And uh, the other exciting news that has happened uh, in the last couple days is that the Story County Community Foundation is unique in that they have a major grant that they award one a year for $25,000. Um, and Nevada's never had an opportunity to, to bring forth a project in support of getting those funds. So we were notified um, that we are finalists. Uh, for, for that fund. So we're one of three that's a finalist and we should know on that, you know, here in the fall as well. So again, we're not talking about a very large gap unless unless we have to show that gap of 707,000, which is basically the contingency. So that's a little bit on the numbers of the project. Uh, we're down to just really your action tonight and collecting the final fundraising efforts. So uh, the action tonight, um, I think, is it all covered under one agenda item? So one of the, the considerations we'd like the council to make is, is in order for us to ultimately strengthen our application and not drag this out uh, to raise another $700,000 was would for, to have you consider uh, tonight uh, additional support for the project up to $707,698 to cover the contingency. So that allows us to keep moving forward with the application in really a manner that shows that we're ready to go. Um, oftentimes communities, and if you have follow uh, some of the news on these at all, but a state will make an award, almost hold those dollars while they're waiting for fundraising to be closed. And and um, we're just in a in an environment where we want things to be able to happen. And, and we hear that with our federal dollars that are coming. We're hearing that on a lot of things. So uh, we believe that putting the position of as little money as possible left to raise will strengthen your application. So again, the action tonight would be up to that amount, not to exceed that amount. Actually, I hope we get really favorable bids and the contingency is not needed uh, because we are so close then without that uh, needing to be considered. So any questions about that? Um, there's more than just me on that committee, but again, I'm trying to express kind of where we were at and why we're putting that request in front of you tonight on top of already what you've committed uh, to the project. Good summary. So the other thing I would say, and then the other fun stuff is, is to actually, there's two required documents that require the mayor's signature and lay a blessing to actually it going in. So it's due officially on Friday and I hope to have it in a few days early in case there's things that the staff catches that we'd still have time to react before the, the actual deadline. So with that, I'll take questions and very anxious for your action. Questions, comments? 
fundraising will continue because we'll have to still raise the rest of the original seven million, but it's really close. And then this will be making sure that the state knows that they are the last dollars in at that point. So the committee will be at Lincoln Highway Days raising money, several football games raising money, some pizza party stuff. So that's kind of the phase that we're in. And do we have any motions? Move to approve resolution Second. 10. Barb and Luke, further discussion? I, uh, sorry. Um, I have no problem supporting this at all. I think everybody knows I've not been completely in agreement with everything the facility is going to have. Um, I think it'd be, it should be bigger. It's not that I have a problem with it. Um, but um, I was disappointed in the fact that I was told by some leadership in the fundraising that I should not speak out about those issues at the request of a large donor a while back. Um, and I think that's unacceptable. We should be encouraging people to speak their mind on whatever they think, uh, publicly, privately in this room. So I hope that that is not the trend that we're trying to set with fundraisers trying to control who can and can't speak about this facility. So I'm not gonna say who reached out to me or anything beyond that, but there's still open discussion that should be going on for this. Other comments? I think it's seeing none, council, please vote. That's approved. Um, takes us to item C, approved five-day class B beer. BB includes wine coolers permit and outdoor service. Renovated JCs to host an outdoor service area at Story County Fairgrounds at 220H Avenue on Saturday, August 28th, 2021 during Lincoln Highway Days. Move we'll approved. Second. Jason Bain, discussion. Why did we change it to 228? Did I miss something in the packet? I mean, it they, covers the whole they... grounds instead of just the Williams Pavilion. So we're just going to let people walk around with beer on the whole fairground? Yes. And PD's okay with that? Yes. Okay. I have my own opinion. But within their staff, so are we going to have security and people and monitoring and all over the whole fairgrounds to monitor the beer consumption and drinking. It's kind of hard to control a 21 year old buying it for his 18 year old buddy if they're sitting in the area or behind the building somewhere. That's the only concern I have. And I'm not really sure if we're having a beer garden with a band why it needs to be the whole property and so of just the area where the so beer garden is. won't be open until later on in the evening. This, are they going to sell it somewhere else other than just a beer? Yeah, they'll have little beer tents, I guess. Yeah. Is it more so we can sell it at the rodeo? Is that the main reason why we're doing it? So we can sell it throughout the day without having to pay. What was that, Jason? So they can sell it throughout the day for what? So they can sell it throughout the day at the parade and not have the beer garden open at that point because nobody goes into the beer garden until the band shows up. This will help them mm -hmm. sell more. It's something they wanted to try this year, see how it goes. So there won't be law enforcement on site until formally on site, assigned to in, in, until it's a beer garden. How it goes, Chief? The beer garden, I have officers there specifically for right. the beer garden. Okay. Um, the sergeants and I have um, put together a schedule to as much as we can. 
the best we can and I'm hoping for the best the best and concerns, but we've never done this before. And What's the procedure, Jason? Do they buy tickets or people? How does it work? How do you card or? Um, you know, and I couldn't tell you. So I think, Stephen, they say they were going. No, you weren't at that meeting, were you? You weren't at that one. I think they're going to do cash during the the booths. But then once you get into the pavilion and the beer garden, then I think it's tickets at that point. They normally have a process for checking IDs. You get your wristband, and then they. What are some of your concerns? I don't know, all day long. That's fine. There's no requirement to have police officers present at the beer stands. Well, the west of there, So my understanding we're going to start their sales at 11. Okay. First thing is open. All day sales Have faith in the ability of the of our citizens to monitor themselves. That's going to be an issue. Okay. Yeah. You are at full staff. I have people down there all day long. Just uh, officers down there, but so, as we can. So, um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And the fortunate part is, uh, I just spend time. What's the difference between the beer stands that are opening at 11 a.m. and going all day and the beer garden? Beer garden with our police officers to be there. Stands do not. I'll look at the choir. The choir will be down there during the course. There's a lot of stuff there. What's the proximity from the beer stand and where we have kids? Stuff that's specifically attracting Me? kids. I mean, you're gonna have people walking everywhere, so well, but there are there are other things, there are other ordinances and things we could choose to implement that would keep alcohol and tobacco a certain distances from schools and playgrounds and libraries. Are we are we putting are we putting this right in front of where every kid's gonna walk by it? And how easy will it be for me to go get it, go buy a beer and hand it to somebody else? Who's gonna be paying if attention? If you want to get arrested, then I'd be pretty easy. I'm just saying who's gonna be paying attention. But is it gonna be easier because there's kids or that there, there's an attraction for high school kids mm -hmm. close by? There's going to be rides to the west, the one stand. Springs inside the sheep barn at this church does. Can, yeah, they, can they say, can those individual groups that are doing things not just the Baptist Church, but others that are sponsoring events, can they say that there's no beer in here? Are they going to be allowed to do that? 
Um, do they have, I mean, do they, do they still have some control over their I mean, area? it's not the area. I mean, they're not paying for that area. Like the Baptist Church isn't paying for the area to be in there. We give them that area for free. So they don't have any, they can't refuse and ask someone to stay out that has I'm sure they could pass. Yeah. They couldn't enforce it unless they have a police officer there. But we're gonna we're gonna think first that folks will do what right. is the best. And if the folks from the Baptist Church are not comfortable with alcohol inside there, this section be it given to them or they're paying for it, if they're providing the leadership for that, are their values gonna be honored in that space? I can't speak on the that part as far as if somebody asked me to not bring alcohol into a certain area because there's a bunch of kids, then I'd probably step out. Oh, that's that's different that would be my hope. People too, though. That would be my hope. But and I think if there were requests, I think knowing the committee, I think they would do what they could to honor that. I'm getting a nod from Steve, so he would concur. Hey, Chief, has the um, JCs, have you done any kind of training to help them identify IDs? And I mean, have they asked for any of that from you guys as a police department? Or do they just? Not, not this year. Um, we have some, uh, we've done some things in the past. Of course, we do officers that are going to be in there. We really haven't had that any trouble in others, but we could interview them. Questions are asking, like Barbara's asking, those are the same questions. Well, I've been involved in Lincoln Highway Days since I started. First year I started here. A lot of good things take place down there. But overall, you know, we have a lot of problems down here. It's generally when you leave, it's really no problem. I have found that the busiest nights that we've ever had here is a little cautious, a little very much here. I think to your question, Susan can correct me if I'm wrong, but for the concert in the spring, didn't some of the JCs do a training course? Yeah, Jeremy got his uh, 
whatever that training course is for crowd management, which that would apply to the beer garden. I don't know how much of that is um, to what we're discussing here. Do you know, Chief? For the beer garden, Let's just hope for the best. Let's see a scenario. That was good. Remind me, did we have a motion? There's a motion and okay. a second. Let's yep. Got that. Any other discussion? Is this question both the garden and the stands, or is this the are we discussing the addition of the stands to the already approved garden? Because then we we approve the. Now this is approving the liquor license for the whole yeah for the whole grounds. Which would be the beer garden and the stands. Because we haven't approved any liquor license for them yet, have we? For this? No. So if this body were to shoot down the overarching thing, would it still be able to approve an amended one for the beer garden itself? You have to make an amendment. Yeah. You know, okay. I mean, but I don't know. Not that I'm not at all leading that way. I just did. It'd have to be revised through the ABD first, correct? What's the question? If they wanted to separate it out and approve just the beer garden without the stands or do some other amendment to it, they'd have to go through ABD first, correct? So. Oh, you don't? Okay. The, the permit allows for what's taking place. Okay. It's one, it's one address. One location, so they can do that. Okay. What I'm saying is, I would hate to see this get shot down and then them not be able to get a liquor license at all for Saturday. Yeah. So that's why I asked that question. I'm all on board with letting it happen, but. Other discussion? Seeing none, council, please vote. Okay, that is approved. So that will take us on to item D, ordinance number 1019, 2021-2022, known as amending chapter 69, parking regulations of the Nevada City Code to establish no parking. Second. Move, Brian, discussion. Seeing none, council, please vote. Okay, that is approved. Takes us to uh, item E, resolution number 11, 2021 2022, a resolution approving Johnson Control Service Agreement to provide inspection of the fire alarm system at City Hall building. Move to approve. Second. Sandy and Dan. Discussion there. Okay. Seeing none, council, please vote. And that's approved. Takes us to report starting with city administrator. Yeah, I, I had the opportunity for the real summit last week, which was uh, very fun and uh, learned quite a bit. One thing that I took back uh, or brought back with me probably most valuable would be the dilapidated buildings and all of the grants and, and things that are available through uh, either the DNR or just um, other grants in general. So had a good time, learned quite a bit. The mayor and Brenda went with with me, and uh, so we went as a group, and good time. Other than that, I my report, if you guys have any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, moving on to my report. I took time really to write one out, and of course, I left it in my car. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I go from memory, and if I forget something, I'll email everybody. 
Um, but I was going to report on the rural summit. I agree. I thought it was well worth our time. I had a couple of sessions that I have some pretty good actionable items uh, to bring back. One of which may be I'm actually eager to talk to our budget committee about our ad hoc issues and see if maybe we have some ideas there that other communities are doing. Um, but other than that, um, Brenda talked about where we are with the field house, which I know was one of the items of uh, the coffee uh, we did a couple weeks ago. Again, was another a good discussion. So the next one will be uh, September 11th, which for those of you that don't have the football schedule memorized like some of us do is a Cyhawk day. So I know we talked to Barb and she was able to do it. If there's anyone else that would like to do it, um, let me know and we'll make sure we get you down for that so that we have a couple of folks there for the coffee. Um, there's probably something I'm forgetting that I wrote down, but with that I can probably just leave it open for questions. Oh, healthy hometown. I wrote, we did have that meeting. Yeah. We have a visioning meeting later in the week. So those things are moving forward still. So with that, we'll go to council reports. Well, the big news on healthy hometown is the community garden. It's like a shining star for the state of Iowa. So big deal. I have the fingers to prove it. <laughs> the produce keeps coming. It's great. And I would have like one bit of advice on that last vote. It would be really great if the JCs, they needed to be here and present that because that is a big change for us. So just a word of advice for future things like that. I'm sure someone can provide that feedback. Other council reports? It's coming. This weekend. Can't wait. Gonna be blessed three days. I don't know. Starts Thursday. All kinds of stuff. I don't think you're ready for it to be done. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm ready for this week. Let's get it. No, that's a, I keep getting meeting requests for Friday, and I'm like, nope. <laughs> okay. Anything else from council? Okay, then we'll go back to staff and go over to our public works. Good evening, everybody. Um, I don't have much to add to my report from two weeks ago, other than you know we're still painting, still patching. Uh, a lot to direct north and south of, of Lincoln Way. A lot of signs, signs and banners trying to get up to the businesses, get people down there. Other than that, that's all I got. I'll answer any questions. Are they done with the South Railroad tracks? Well, I did talk to the railroad today. They're a contractor for the railroad. They are done. They thought they were done. They've lost their detour signs. They're still on 19th Street this morning. They <laughs> thought they were done, but um, we're going to have them come back and add a little more asphalt, smooth them out a little bit. Uh, they have to admit that they tried to do them too fast, didn't do a good enough job. And I agree, you know. Well, they're going to come back and fix a couple of them. So okay. they just moved. It'll, be short, it'll be short time closures. I mean, no. But there's no. just, there's still a lot of orange signs around. We're, we're warning us of things that were not happening. Detour signs, road closed ahead signs that, and the roads aren't closed along 19th, along they're, 6th Street. They're getting them picked up. I mean, like, they're leading them around and making them pick it. You know, they're just, I've suggested that they get them picked up, but so I was on the phone with them a few hours ago. Any other questions? Anyone's on? Good evening, everyone. Um, with my report, not much has changed. Uh, permits are still going through. Uh, projects are still continuing to go. So we um, yeah, have a lot to look forward to. There's a lot of good things coming down the pipeline. So any questions or anything? Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Then an exciting piece of news, Brenda, we had talked about was our interim economic development director. She's now been officially appointed the permanent economic development director for Nevada Economic Development. So officially want to welcome Brenda to the capacity. Y'all have gotten to know her, so it doesn't mean much of an intro, but that was when it was brought up to the executive committee. There, there were some audible cheers. <laughs> People were really excited about that prospect, so she'll be a good fit for the community, and we're excited to have her. I, I feel really lucky. Lots going on. It's going to be anything for Brenda while she's here. Thank you. Thank you for your work on the cat grant. This is a busy week for us as we get ready to get things going for Lincoln Highway Days, doing some stuff with that. Um, it's also the last week that the Aquatic Center will be open. So we will be open in the afternoons uh, through Friday from noon to four. So um, most all of our staff has gone back and after this weekend, that'll pretty much be the end of, of what we'll have for staff. So um, other than that, we're starting fall programming now. So uh, we're kind of in that transition mode. So um, be happy to answer any questions you might have. I was wondering where summer went. <laughs> right. uh, it, well, you know, it was a good summer. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it was extremely hot. So I think we had a good summer attendance wise at the pool. And so um, staff did a good job. We had a, a new group, which uh, having a year off from COVID uh, changed things quite a bit, you know, staffing wise. So uh, we had a good group and uh, but uh, time to time to put it to bed now. So. Yeah, on a more personal side, we extended longer. I pass that on. Six weeks is just not long enough. I second that. Well, you're on my team. I know. Well, <laughs> Anna and I talked about that a couple weeks okay. ago. Yeah. So sounds good. All right. Thank and you. or a tournament at the end. Yeah, the and or a tournament. Yeah. There you or go. both. Or both. Guys with high hearts. Council members get a buy in the first round. <laughs> <laughs> Not touching that. <laughs> you ask me, then we'll talk about it. So, all right, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Well, most of my news you already covered. <laughs> hiring a new officer and uh, Lincoln Highway days. Uh, so those are the big things I had. Um, we're, uh, so we've already started the process for another officer to be our, assuming things don't change. If when we do hire that person, we'll be at full staff. First time in a long, long time. So um, I think uh, Chris told me we got 11 applications so far, which is, which is pretty good considering the environment. So. I've looked, I've glanced at the, um, some of the applicants, they, they look pretty promising, but I got to go through the gauntlet first, so we'll see how that goes. Um, Ryan might be able to help me on this one a little bit. Um, Ray was going to talk about this, but he had to go to another meeting. Uh, we had a training fire yesterday uh, on E Avenue. Um, a little yellow house that has been empty as long as I can remember. Um, so we got the permits and all that to do the training fire and, and talking with Ray yesterday and today, it went fantastic. A lot of good training. Firefighters really liked it. Um, and um, they got a lot out of it. Uh, is there anything you can add about that, Ryan? Um, not really. I mean, it went really, really well. They got a lot of evolutions in. Um, Polo came and participated in it. Uh, bringing an engine as well as uh, staff to be able to go through some of the evolutions. It's not very often that a fire department gets to train with live fire. Um, and I think that puts the data ahead a lot because we have fire people who want to go and find these houses as well as the training facility that they're building at the, at the dump. It, it'll save a lot of lives in the long term. Uh, giving these firefighters and Exposing them to what it's really like inside of a house that's on fire. 
Well, like I said, it went it went really well. If you happen to drive by it, it's still still smoldering. It's probably going to smolder for a few more days, but. Um, for the most part, um, all the neighbors didn't no issues with them. They were aware of what was going to take place and um, understood that there's going to be some smoldering for a little while. But overall, it, it, cleaning it and then building on it. So it, that'll be nice. Um, it, it's been needed to come down for a long time. So any other questions? Can I Thank ask you. a quick, quick question? Did you get a chance um, to follow up about the no parking signs for the parade detour part of the route? We will have no parking signs for the detour route, correct? For the like on H Street, there's H parking Street. on the east side, but the band will not make it through. <laughs> the committee submitted a letter it's saying not, that they there's, wanted. There's if no, it's not on there, then it's not. I didn't approve it. Okay. They didn't, they didn't even list, Steve, it's your letter. It didn't even list the 8th Street where there's one side parking and uh, K Avenue where there's one side parking and on that way. What's on the letter is what's been approved. If it's not on there, then I'm going to need here for some people pretty quick to get it get it changed. Well, I'm, we'll have to take a look into that. I'm pretty certain there wasn't any consideration. Okay, because I would say even the big equipment, if there's parked cars on the east side, it's not going to make through. I'm, I'm not doubting what you're telling me, but I have to approve what's presented to me. I think the need to several iterations. Okay. I'll talk to Ryan tomorrow and we can reach out to the vehicles that typically park there and the owners around the area. and it's, let all, them. it's all folks that live on the street. Yeah, so we'll let them know that yeah. at that for that particular time that we're going to have the parade on and there. NCRC would be empty during that time. You know, their their parking would be empty. Folks could, you know, you can make a suggestion. We'd still want signage though, because there's a lot of people that don't live right there that are going to drive up. They're going to come and drive up yeah. and walk to Lincoln Way or stay in front. Sounds like Steve's got it. Yep. Nice. Otherwise, you know, you're going to see the parade. Thank you. Karen. Um, already with the auditor getting in from the reports um, to get started. It seems like we just got done, but we're going again. Um, they're working with a short staff, so I apologize for many things. We're doing the best we can, shorthanded. Um, we have received our letter for the first payment for our ARP funds for, the, for those anytime. So okay. Council I need to carry on. Hey. Well I was gonna tell you that I uh, we have a full report of the projects but Karen just whispered in my ear that she didn't reach a cop yet. So that'll be coming. <laughs> so I'll try to hit some of the highlights that you might remember them. There is a uh, the ninety percent plans have been completed for the Whistler Paper Plant, Forest Mains, and Point Line, and there's a meeting scheduled with the uh, review committee tomorrow. Four to five o'clock. That's drawing to a close. The uh, downtown project and talking with contract yesterday. Um, the underground contract contract was moved to. Are working on the last block of Sixth Street, and it's estimated they have about six weeks of work to complete all of the underground and limited services in the buildings. And uh, sometime before they probably be completed with that, because so part of that is extending the water main um, north of Penn Avenue, up to Penn Avenue, making up there. So while they're finishing some of that, the construct can come in and start doing some of the paving in with that. Long story short, they should be uh, they should be paving on Lincoln Highway here pretty shortly. That most of the uh, subdated rock in place, which is the last thing before they start paving, so that should begin soon. And then they'll um, get all that and move on to Sixth Street. Uh, and hopefully get everything done by about the end of October. 
That's kind of what we're shooting for now. It does have a November one completion date. For completion. Looks like they should be able to reach that. Um, the only other thing I'd like to mention is that we did receive a subdivision plat, subdivision developed by South B Avenue, South D Avenue, and 14th Street to the west of Burke Plant. Um, this is on the Mid America Industries building, I think it's Mid American Industries. We the land west or east of their east of that building, and that's a three. It's a four lot subdivision that's created a lot for the existing building and then three uh, lots to be developed. Uh, in conjunction with that, we received a site plan, two site plans essentially for coffee shop, Bergie's uh, coffee shop, and uh, an American car wash. That both of those are from the South E Avenue. And the site plans and uh, Range report for all of that. So we're in the process of reviewing all of those and we should be seeing something very soon. Oh, so with that, I'm going to answer your question tonight. Oh, it's going to be south of South B or north of South B? Where is that going to be in relation to South B? South, 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 south of South B. B and D. Okay. else and nothing for me okay. i thought of one more thing on my report too the foundation got its 501c3 status from the irs after going after that for a couple years so it's all official cool. so i'm sure you'll see more too because there's some other community groups i think that could really partner to that mechanism otherwise we have the closed session next um so that would be the closed session pursuant to Iowa Code Section 21.51I to evaluate the professional competency of an individual with appointment hiring performance or discharge is being considered when necessary to prevent needless and irreparable injury to the individual's reputation and that individual requests a closed session. No, no. Okay. Okay, Jason. We'll have to take a roll call, I believe. Oh, it's on the thing. Okay. Council, please vote. Yes. Or, yeah. Hey, Barb. Barb. You vote yes to go into close? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Your button for you. And we'll take a couple minute start to break anyway as we transition. And hey, Henry. Can I grab Do you want me to just stop the Zoom part and then yeah. it doesn't matter anymore? Okay. I'm going to run out here, but yeah, I'm going to come back and get you. Are you going to have a separate recording? Yeah. Are you, yeah, are you going to record oh, okay. separately? Yeah. Okay.